So my name is Rick Ashley. I'm from Fort Worth, Texas. I've been there a long time. And uh, let me get something out of the way, uh, because uh, I have been attending this lectureship now and teaching at it for this is my 35th straight year, before some of you were even born. And uh, for the last two years, I had to start with an apology that while I usually do a three-day class, I would only do a two-day class because two years ago, uh, I had to get back for graduation for my daughter at ACU who was finishing nursing school. She uh, actually was a graduate of Pepperdine and then got back home and decided she'd like to go back to nursing school. And so we're very, very proud of her. And then last year I had to leave early because my son was graduating ACU and I had to get back for his graduation. Let me just report that all of my kids now are through with college. <laughs> and for the first time in over 20 years, I am not paying any Christian school anywhere to educate them. <laughs> Which means my wife and I have got a big raise. <laughs> we are pumped. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, I'm really grateful. Proud of my kids. And, but this year I get to be here all three days and I'm excited about that. So, obviously, if I've been coming for 35 years... I am uh, been around the track a few times. It's pretty obvious I'm not a spring chicken anymore. Uh, some of you heard me say, you know, in my 20s, I just get up in the morning, uh, just go all day, play basketball all night. I wake up the next day, just go. Then I hit my 30s, I'd play basketball all night, I'd wake up in the morning, and I was sore. Okay. Then I hit my 40s, and I wake up in the morning, and I was sore, and I didn't do anything last night. Okay. <laughs> Now I've officially reached that age that some of you can relate to where I can hurt myself going to bed, okay? <laughs> I can wake up in the morning. My neck hurts. I must have slept wrong. How pitiful is that? I hurt myself sleeping. <laughs> so when you get older, you have to make some lifestyle changes. You just have to. You can't eat as much as you used to. You have to be a little bit more conscious about trying to exercise. Uh, growing up, I never learned to like coffee. And so my caffeine choice growing up was the national drink of Texas, which of course is the Dr. Pepper. I drank a lot of Dr. Peppers when I was in college. Uh, but then as a young man, you realize as your metabolism changes, you can't handle a lot of sugar like you used to. And so it, it took a while, but I taught myself to like Diet Coke. Okay? And I thought, no calories. I can drink all the Diet Coke I want. <laughs> And so I was drinking Diet Coke all day long. And I got really convicted a few years ago. I'm drinking too much Diet Coke. I need to stop. Uh, for one thing, I don't know if you heard about a recent study that said there could be a connection between diet soda and short-term memory loss. Uh, and then there's been studies in the past that said there could be a connection between artificial sweetener and some kinds of cancer. And there's no way all that carbonation and caffeine in my body every day is good for me. And I don't know if you heard about this, but there's a recent study that said there could be a connection between diet soda and short-term memory loss. And so I, <laughs> I said, I'm going to start drinking more water and less Diet Coke. And I got to be honest, I have not done very good at what I said I was going to do. And because we all know we hold fast to convictions we don't live by. So if I said to you, the church should reach the lost, who's going to argue with me about that? We all hold that conviction, and very few of our churches are reaching the lost. In fact, I would argue that it's not even on the top five agendas of most of our churches, a burden for the lost. We've got burdens for lots of things, but the voice of the lost person is hardly ever in the room when we're talking about what's most important at our church. So I'm going to spend several days just talking about Reaching more lost people. Uh, and uh, I hope you'll stay with me. Uh, I, I'm not an expert on this, but I'm passionate about this. And I have seen some fruit in this. In the last 16 months, our church has baptized 700 people. And uh, I've been talking with other church leaders who are seeing great fruit in evangelism. And I sat down with some of them and said, how, did, how, how do you create a church culture where... Uh, the people who aren't there are the passion and the burden. And, and what I'm going to do, 
I'm going to share a text every day from the life of Jesus about how we can create that culture. But first, every day, I'm going to start with two questions for you, okay, to take home to your church and to your leaders. Here's question number one. Are we expecting evangelism without evangelists? In other words, who in the leadership of your church is always a champion for the people who aren't there? Who's speaking for them? So about 15 years ago, a guy comes to our church. He had been in the Yankees baseball organization, blew out his shoulder, couldn't play baseball anymore, looking for meaning in life. He was dating a girl from our church. He comes to our church and says, I hated it. Hated everything about it until I got up to speak. And he started connecting, not because of me, because of the Holy Spirit. Well, David Meyer eventually got baptized. And David Meyer doesn't know any better than think, well, now that I'm a Christian, I should tell everyone else to be one too. So this guy just started telling everybody in his business. He owned an awning business. It just seemed like every other month he was in the baptistry with somebody. He goes online to take apologetics courses so he can start answering questions of people about faith. So he finally approached David and said, David, sell that business and come work with the church. And so David's now one of our ministers of evangelism. David's sole purpose is to keep us focused. So every time we have a big event, we talk about how many people came. Every time we do something to raise some money, every time we start a new thing, he always is there to be that irritant in the room that says, but did anybody come to Christ? That's his job, and he's good at his job. And he's one of the reasons we're changing the culture. He is constantly championing for the people who weren't there. Do you have that person? Who in your leadership is that champion? Can you have evangelism if you don't have any evangelists? David has that gift. I swear, if the guy sneezes, somebody accepts Christ. It is amazing. <laughs> and I would say this too. The primary voice of your church has got to have a burden for people far from God. Now, I, I, may, I don't have the gift of evangelism quite like David does. But I'm the primary voice in our church. And if the primary voice in your church does not have a burden for the loss, you will never create a culture of evangelism, period. He's got to speak it. He's got to breathe it. He's got to live it. I had the privilege of my wife and I went to a, a, a Christian church state convention in Missouri a couple of weeks ago. And we went to the seniors' luncheon for one reason, to hear Ben Merrill. He's a legend among independent Christian churches, if you know Ben. He came out to Eastside Christian Church in uh, California, in L.A., 30 or 40 years ago. Took a little church of about 100 people and built it up to 3,000. It was unheard of at that time. He retired at 65. He moved to St. Louis uh, to retire, and a little church called Harvester Christian said, Come be our preacher while we look. So he went there at 65, 200 people. He retired again at 82. He had grown to 4,000 people. So I'm at this luncheon. It's a senior luncheon. Everybody in there is 78 and been a Christian for 60 years. And Ben can't help himself. Before he's through with his little devotional talk, he offers the invitation. He says, if you're here and you don't know Jesus and you've never been baptized and you've never confessed Christ, you need to see me before you leave today. He can't help himself. It's not a coincidence that everywhere he goes, churches grow. The primary voice has got to have that burden. Are we expecting evangelism in churches when we don't have evangelists? That's question number one. Here's question number two. Are we expecting our church to just drift into evangelism? That somehow if we just say we're all convicted, it'll just happen. Because too often especially in our shrinking tribe, our growth plan is sell the building and move to a booming suburb. So right where you are, what's your plan? I'm just going to ask several questions. I'm not saying that these are all right for you, but these are questions we've asked. Are we maximizing the potential of social media? I promise you, in this culture today, 90% of your guests will check your website before they visit your church. Some of us are losing the battle before we even have a chance right there. Are we maximizing the potential of days like Easter and Christmas Eve? I grew up, we didn't even acknowledge Easter and Christmas Eve. I have more 
unchurched people come into my building on Christmas Eve than any single day of the year. It's not a holiday. It is an absolute harvest opportunity. Are we connecting to men? I just have to be careful here. I'll go on a rant and get myself in trouble. You want to win your community? Win the men. We have a men's conference every year, and we just blow it out. Our women, they do a conference. They spend weeks decorating the building. I am not kidding. I'm not kidding. That I forgot it was women's conference weekend. I walked in. They took over all the bathrooms. I forgot. I walked into the men's bathroom. They had taken it over. They had put flower arrangements in the urinals. I swear they broke a commandment in Leviticus somewhere. We have a men's conference and we do two things. We tell them we're going to barbecue lots of meat and we're going to play loud music. But I'm telling you, if you want to reach your city, reach your men. Uh, number four, are we demonstrating a commitment to diversity? When people come to your church, do they see people of color on the stage? Do they see men and women? Do they see young and old? Do people immediately get the sense this church welcomes people like me? Um, are we planning special harvesting moments? We're very intentional about this where I preach. We have an event every year called The Thorn. We just got through having it. It's just a play on the life of Christ. We had 30 baptisms that weekend. Um, we have a thing called Summer Spectacular. It's RVBS. It's on steroids. Uh, we had 90 baptisms last year. Uh, we have twice a year what we just call Baptism Weekend, and we just promote it and we promote it. Are you thinking about getting baptized? We do classes. Why should you get baptized? We have a special weekend. We, bring, we buy the clothes. We, we, we just go all out. People respond. Um, are we celebrating conversion stories? It's not that hard anymore. We all have the technology. You don't have to have a team of 12 people just to take a little video of someone who just became a Christian and show the church. And let them all share the excitement. Are we creating a culture where sharing faith is expected? David uh, came up with this phrase, who's your one? And it's become part of the vocabulary of our church. You see people all the time in the baptistry, this is so-and-so, and she's my one. We have it on the wall. We have a discipleship pathway, the seven steps we want you to take. What's your next step? And step number one, tell your one. It's number seven, tell your one. Are we creating the expectation that we should be reaching our one? And that's what I want to do now for the rest of the time. I want to talk to you about how we all have a one. Uh, before I get there, I wanted to show you the little video we made that we play ever so often to try to create this culture. Stop me if you've heard this one. You grow up, you graduate high school, you attend the best college you can get into, and a few years later you graduate again. You marry the perfect girl and move into a small character-building apartment. Over the next couple of years, you had a house, a dog, and two-ish children. A perfect start to a picket fence life. Time begins to roll by, your kids grow up, you get involved at your church just like you're supposed to do. And sure, you have opportunities to engage more with the outside world, but it's hard enough to balance your job, church, wife, and two-ish kids. Your life continues speeding along, your children grow up and make you a grandfather. Eventually, you retire and start spending a little too much time in Florida, but it's okay to relax. After two generations, you've impacted the eight lives in your family. Finally, at the end of it all, the Lord calls you home. And it was a good life, right? Work, family, church, because whichever order you put them in, that's all there is, right? What would happen if we shook up that formula? Imagine if we went out of our way to engage with our world, coworkers, neighbors, old friends, and not just engage, disciple. Imagine if we took one year and discipled one person from our world, took a year and truly shared the message of love, salvation, and freedom in Christ to that one person. And what if inside that year that person started to follow Jesus? But let's not stop there. What if the next year that person began to disciple someone else and you did the same thing and two more people came to know Christ? And what if you did this year after year, person after person, and each of them picked one person year after year, and each of them, and each of them. If this kept going for 30 years, 
That would mean that 1,073,741,824 people could hear the gospel. That's a little more than eight. The thing is, it's not a joke, and it's not a gimmick. Most importantly, it's not impossible. It's one person boldly making a commitment to bringing one other person to Christ. And it all starts by asking the question, who's your one? So there's nothing that thrills my heart more. It happens every week when someone stops, hey, Rick, pray hard this week. My one is here. Um, we're not asking our people to reach the city. We're asking every single person to have a one, to be intentional. And you'll hear sometimes, but I've been a Christian so long, I don't have any friends who aren't Christians. I'm going to suggest that we have more ones than we realize. We're just not seeing them. And so that's why I'm going to call this class Even That One. So the text I want to uh, really dive into this morning is out of Luke chapter 5. Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him, and Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. And then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and teachers of the law, who belonged to their sect, complained to his disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners, to repentance." Now, the problem with this story that you already know well is it's hard to find a cultural equivalent in our society. Who do we know that we could compare to a tax collector? You know that the people of that day are governed by an oppressing uh, force called the Roman Empire. The Romans ruled by fear, not by kindness. They sent soldiers into occupied territory. Those guys had swords, and they were told, don't be afraid to use them. You're not going to be brought before any council if you have to kill a few people to keep order. So every day as you grow up in your home country, you see on the streets men who aren't afraid to oppress and brutalize if they have to. And you hate that. But how does Rome finance that? Simple. You tax the local people. You take money from the locals to support the army that you don't want there in the first place. How do you collect the money? You get locals to do it. You go to people and say, this is how much we want, and anything over that that you get, you can keep for yourself. What cultural equivalent do we have to this? If you had somebody in your business that was stealing from you, and taking some of what he stole from your business and was supporting ISIS, how would you feel about that person? You see, if you're a tax collector, you're not just a cheater, you are a traitor. You're not just dishonest, you're disloyal. So getting close to someone like this is a terrible PR move if you're a politician. Now Jesus is this young, new, exciting rabbi, and everybody's wondering, could he be the one and then he starts to walk in the direction of Levi, and everybody's pumped and excited because they know what he's going to say. He's going to walk right up to that guy and say, How dare you? And instead, Jesus said, How are you? And then he said, Why don't you? And then he said, Party at your house. You've got to understand the power of that. Because in that culture, the primary way you communicated friendship was eating together. Not by clicking like on Facebook. When you ate with somebody, you were saying to the world, this is my friend, I'm in their corner, I've got their back. So Jesus knows exactly what he's doing when he said, let's go have a party at your house. Because here's the thing, Jesus made followers because he made friends. He didn't just forgive sinners, he friended them. He made friends as a strategy for making disciples. And doing so made waves. So a couple of chapters later, Jesus said, I know what they're saying about me. The Son of Man comes eating and drinking. 
You say he's a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Well, that's half true and half wrong. He wasn't a drunkard or a glutton, but it was totally true. He was a friend, not, not, not an acquaintance, a genuine friend to tax collectors and sinners. And to his critics, they, they just can't see how that works because their criticism was totally consistent with their theology. In their theology, God loves people to do right. God hates people to do wrong. We're supposed to hate people to do wrong. They despised Levi because they knew God did. See, this story reveals a critical aim about the mission of Jesus. Jesus didn't come to change God's mind about us. He came to change our minds about God. Because God wants to be friends with everyone, even that one that is currently living like his enemy. So the Tarrant County Jails are very kind to us. They allow when they have their worship times to, to show CDs of my, or DVDs of my sermons to the prisoners. And about once or twice a year, I, get, I go to the jails and, and preach in person. So a year or two ago, I was at the jail, and then when I'm through, two of these inmates came up. Pastor Rick, Pastor Rick, did you know the Bible says there won't be any women in heaven? I said, I didn't know that. Where did you read that? They said, Revelation chapter 8, verse 1. Then he opened the seventh seal, and there was silence in heaven for half an hour. <laughs> now, I don't think that's what that verse means. I don't think they thought is what it means. But I do want to make a point. Anytime we read the scriptures to justify reading somebody out of God's story, out of God's mission, and out of God's love, we've read the Bible wrong. Who can be invited to follow Jesus? Any one. Even that one that everyone else has dismissed, has not missed the invitation list to Jesus' party. So how can we be sure we don't meet this? I'm going to give you three quick principles for developing a more evangelistic culture. Not just in your church, but I'm talking about in your own personal life. Three simple principles. Here's number one. See, patience, not problems. Patience and not problems. Now, I know people can be annoying and difficult because we can be annoying and difficult. But do we see people as problems or do we see people with problems? Uh, my daughter uh, met me after our late service Sunday and we were going to go for a run downtown uh, in Fort Worth. So we got out a little bit later. We had changed clothes into our running clothes. We're walking out late and there's this, there's this group of guys hanging around these two hot rods in my parking lot. They're not the same skin color as me, and, and you could just tell they grew up in a different environment. And they saw me, Pastor, nice shoes. They liked my running shoes. And they started talking, and frankly, they used some vocabulary I don't even understand. What I did understand was one of them said, that's what I'm talking about. And they had on sideways caps, and they had on their tats and all that stuff. And, and I got to the car, and I turned around, and I said, Morgan, those guys are from the hood. How cool is that? They're from the hood, and they're coming to church. Now, if a bunch of guys from the hood walk into your church next Sunday, are somebody going to see a problem or a patient? Too often, we view people more on the basis of how much we're different from them than how much we're actually alike. It's like the story of the couple, they're in bed one stormy night, and they hear a knock on the door. And the guy goes downstairs, and he opens the door, and there is a guy, he's sopping wet, he reeks of alcohol, saying, say, buddy, can you give a fella a push? And he says, no, it's the middle of the night, and slams the door, goes back upstairs. His wife says, who was it? Says, some guy probably drunk wanting to push. And she says, now aren't you something? Do you remember a month ago in that storm when we had our car stalled and these two strangers showed up and helped us? Shouldn't you do unto others? You're right. So he puts on some clothes, goes back downstairs, opens the door. It's still raining. He shouts, you still out there? And he hears a voice, yeah. You still need a push? Yeah. Well, where are you? 
over here on the swing set. So here's the point. <laughs> we tend to look at people and almost immediately our fallen nature wants to say, I wonder how they're not like me. When in fact, if you knew their story, you would find out that we are so much more alike. Because every patient has a story that should make us more patient. Think about Levi. How did he wind up where no Jewish boy ever aspired to be? No Jewish boy said when he was little, you know what I want to do? I want to be one of the most hated persons in the country. I want people to cuss me and spit at me when they walk by all day long. That's the goal for my life. How did Levi wind up where he was? Did his father die when he was little and he had to do something to help his family? Was he handicapped? And in that culture, if you couldn't move, you couldn't work. Did he have a sick child? And he was desperate to make some money. So I don't know how he got there, but Jesus saw in him a heart that didn't want to stay there. Levi didn't want to stay stuck. He didn't want to stay sick. Do you? When you wake up in the morning and you feel bad, do you think, you know what, I hope I feel like this all day long? It's not the healthy people that need a doctor. It's the sick. I've not come to invite good people, but sinners to change their hearts and lives. It wasn't a problem for Jesus to see even that one as something more than a problem. He saw kingdom possibilities in Levi that nobody else could imagine. Because here's the thing. When you have been put down, looked down on, thought less of your whole life, Levi would have never come after Jesus if Jesus hadn't first come after Levi. See patience, not problems. Second simple principle, stay near, not far. One of the biggest mistakes religion often makes is to equate separation from sin with isolation from sinners. And I understand there's a tension. I really do. If you are battling alcoholism you probably don't need to go to a bar after work to witness to your friends okay if you have a gambling addiction you probably don't need to meet a couple at a casino for supper and all of us that are have, have been parents know the tension of when your children are growing up you you try to discern based on how mature they are what temptations they can handle and what temptations they just don't need to be around yet. So I do get it. I do get that there's a tension. And cautious wisdom is needed, especially when it involves the weak and the immature. But here's the thing. Every follower of Jesus is a missionary. What does a missionary do? The missionary leaves the culture where he feels the most comfortable to go and enter into a different culture where he feels like an outsider so that he can invite people to be insiders on the kingdom of God. Isn't that what Jesus did? You understand Jesus was a missionary. Jesus left the home where everything was right to enter into a culture where everything was wrong to invite people to enter into the kingdom of God. You see, what doctor says, I can't be around sick people, I might get a disease. <laughs> That's what doctors do. It really is possible to be in the world, but not of the world. So I remember, uh, and all you moms know this, that your boy, when he's one, or two, three grades, he's just as cute as he can be. About fourth grade, he starts learning a few words he doesn't tell you at home. And by the time he's in middle school, he can be a full-fledged potty mouth, and you don't even know it. Okay? So that's what happened to my friends. By the time I was in middle school, they were all 
pretty vulgar. So my father notices one Saturday, I'm not at my friend's, he said, you haven't been going over to your friends lately as much to pray. How come? Oh, Dad, I don't feel comfortable. All they want to do is cuss. I expected my father to say, Well done, my good and faithful son. (laughs) You are the child in whom I am well pleased. Tonight your brother gets oatmeal, but you, my beloved, get steak, you know. (laughs) And to my astonishment, my father says, Well, Rick, they use a lot of bad words where I work too. But I kind of think that my friends and maybe your friends need a friend who can be around and show you can be a good guy and have fun without using those words. I had never thought that as my friends develop traits and habits that could take them further from God, that's when they needed me more, not less. Notice, Levi gave a big dinner for Jesus at his house. And many tax collectors and other people were eating there too. Notice the party was at Levi's house. Do you know how Jesus could have avoided a lot of criticism? He could have said, Levi, let's meet at Chili's. (laughs) Jesus, you don't have to go to... Jesus, why would you want to go to his house? Jesus would have said, simple. (laughs) I make a lot more friends. Because usually, community precedes conversion. Maybe in the old days, people would believe and then they'd go find a church and belong. But today, people are going to see, can I belong before they care what you believe? Are you willing to be a friend? Um, shortly after I taught this lesson at my church, I got an email from a woman in our church named Kelly. And uh, she talked about how going into high school, she had only been inside a church building twice in her life. Now, this is Fort Worth, Texas. A lot of people would consider us kind of the Bible Belt. Her family was completely dysfunctional, and so you would expect she lived the life and had the habits of somebody that was very far from God. But a friend from high school invited her to go on a retreat, and she went not because she cared about Jesus, but because she wanted to belong. And at that retreat, she heard a word, and the Holy Spirit did a work that totally wiped her out. And the next thing you know, she's asking, can, can you bring me to church? And so she starts going to church, and this older woman in the church took an interest in her, started meeting with her regularly to share scripture with her, and eventually she came to faith. She wrote me and said, I also think about all the people who mentioned above and how they allowed the Holy Spirit to work in them. As a parent now, I see how it could have been so easy for those parents to keep their kids away from me. All they knew about me was that I didn't go to church and I made a lot of bad choices. They didn't know my parents at all, but they knew my home life was bad. That isn't who church-going parents typically want their kids to be around. But because they took some risk, I was able to learn about the gospel and realize I wanted something different from my life. And from that, my younger sister also became a Christian. We both married fellow believers and were raising our families and homes where we want to follow Jesus. That same little church helped her go to ACU where she met a fine Christian guy. They're part of our church now. And every year they spend a couple of weeks in Haiti at an orphanage. I mean, her life is completely changed. What would have happened if after that first retreat, a child comes back and says, guess who came? And mom and dad said, I hope she doesn't show up again. You're going to get criticized for some of your choice of friends. So here's my theory. No matter what we do, we're going to get criticized. Let's get criticized for doing what Jesus did. 
Jesus thought any one was worth it, even that one. But here's the most important thing. Okay, you got, we got to see patience, not problems. We have to stay near, not far. Here's the hardest thing. I think it's the most important thing. We have to learn to say start, not stop. Because typically when we come up to a Levi, the first thing we want to do is give him a lecture. Jesus didn't confront Levi with a lecture about his past. He approached him with an offer for his future. He didn't walk up to Levi and say, I am so stinking disappointed in you. You're selling us all out. Really? A little coin is worth more than the heritage of generations? No. He said, follow me. Now, get this. Jesus called Levi to follow him at Levi's absolute worst version of himself. In other words, he didn't say, Levi, I see some potential, but I need to see more. You get your act together. I'll be along the road in about a month. And if I see some improvement, then I'm going to invite you to come follow me. When he called Levi, Levi was at the absolute worst version of himself because I am does as is. You know what I mean. You've been to a used clothing store and you see as is. And you know that means the sweater's got a hole in it. You know that means the shirt has a stain. You know when you do as is, there's a flaw. So get this. This is so big. The Gospels are not full of stories of people changing and then following Jesus. They are full of stories of people following Jesus and then changing. And by the way, that's why the, church, the charge that the church is full of hypocrites need to be rethought. Churches are supposed to be full of sinners. When sinners aren't in churches, we need to close the door. Something's wrong. Hospitals are for sick people. Turn to your neighbor and say, you are sick. Okay? You really are. Yes, my church is full of hypocrites. I got people in my church totally just faking and pretending. But I got a lot of people in my church fornicating and lusting and lying and cheating and getting angry but trying to follow Jesus. They're sick, but they're getting better. Is that okay? I got to tell you, you think about this. Are you okay with people in your church that don't believe you and ask really hard questions? You need to be. Are you okay with people in your church that are totally confused about their sexual identity? Do they have to figure that out before they can come to your church? One of the big problems in our church is we don't have confidence in the Holy Spirit. That if somebody will just start following Jesus, the Holy Spirit will help them get better. We want them to get well. And then come to church. It's the other way around. So, um, Inmates are the most resourceful people in the world. And uh, you can't smoke in prison. Most inmates have a smoking issue. So I saw this documentary. They were interviewing these guys, and, and they would take uh, tea leaves, and they would take the, the residue from the nicotine gum they were supposed to chew, and they'd mix it together, and they'd roll it up in paper and turn it into something to smoke. The problem is their notebook paper burned too fast, so they were using the paper from their Gideon Bibles because it smoked slower. So they were interviewing Robert, and he said, I smoke Matthew. I smoke Mark. I smoke Luke. And then I got to John, and I read that Jesus loves me, and I stopped smoking. 
And that reminded me of a story. We, like a lot of your churches, we have a, we have a group at our church that meets several times a week for people who are recovering from addiction issues. And they're trying to use, oh, no, they're not trying, they are, they are allowing the Holy Spirit and the gospel to speak into their addiction problems. So they meet up at our church. That's why if you came to our church outside the main entrance, you will see ashtrays. Because most of these people have to gather and get a cigarette smoke before they go into their support group. So you know what's going to happen. This happens every now and then. A couple of years ago, a young mom comes up to me and she's angry. I brought my daughter up to church on Tuesday night for something. There was a bunch of people outside smoking. I said, what were they smoking? <laughs> Cigarettes. I praise God they're making progress. I mean, <laughs> they're getting better. Listen to me. We don't fix anyone. We invite everyone to start following Jesus. And we let them know, you got a friend. He's the doctor. His grace is the answer. Paul would put it this way. God's grace has made me what I am. And His grace to me was not wasted. It wasn't wasted on Levi either. You probably know him by his other name, Matthew. And he wrote a gospel that has helped Jesus meet a whole lot more friends. You say, I don't have a one. Yes, you do. You just haven't noticed him yet. He's there waiting for you to say, you got a friend. Let's go follow Jesus. Thanks for coming. I'll see you tomorrow.